Colorado is a great place to live, but for many, our mental health and substance abuse systems aren't working for them. Over one million Coloradans have mental health conditions. That's 20% of our state. Our mental health outcomes are the bottom half of the country. And we have the seventh highest suicide rate in the United States. Overdose, races are increase, overdose rates are increasing. So last year, our governor created a behavioral health task force to look at system reform and recommend bold ideas to make the system put people first. The task force had 27 members plus another 75 subcommittee members. We met tirelessly and very often to consider options. All of our work was informed by experts and hundreds and hundreds of Coloradans who shared their personal stories of their experience with our behavioral health system, including one who's here today who will be speaking later. We listened, we learned, and we debated with passion. And now we are happy to share with you and the governor the final blueprint, which all 27 members have endorsed. I'd like to invite Governor Polis to the podium. We already know his great work on saving people money on health care, and today we're going to talk about his leadership on behavioral health. Thank you, Governor. That's great. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for helping to coordinate and, and for your team for helping to staff this effort. Uh, really an exciting day, the fruition of a lot of work, not just a blueprint but an action plan handed off to the governor's office, to the legislature to really begin work. I want to begin by thanking the stakeholders, the advocates, community members who've worked tirelessly for more than a year uh, to get us where we are today. And we have a number of folks with us. Uh, I want to thank Allison Butler, Becky Ella, Corey Nodestein, Kurt Drennan, Daniel Darding, Glenn Most, Jen Fanning, John Lockenen, Kim Bimsteffer, Michelle Barnes, Neil Epperson, Patricia Oliver, Raina Gonzalez, Raul de Villegas Decker, Shannon Van Demon, Tracy Kraft Tharp, Vincent Achity, uh, Robert Whatever, and Mike Conway. Those are just the folks who are here, and uh, there's many, and, and many of them have come from different parts of the state, I think from Grand Junction, Colorado Springs, uh, and uh, there are many others uh, that, that are really proud to put their name on this that, that weren't able to join us today. You know, a lot of people on the task force and a lot of people that they heard from lost loved ones because of the challenges in mental health, behavioral health, the Byzantine system that isn't patient-centered. Uh, to everybody who's lost a loved one, uh, I want to express that we're profoundly sorry for your loss. Uh, I'm grateful that those who turn that loss into giving back and making things better for others uh, are able to help others along the way by helping to enact these changes. In the spring of 2019, I established the Behavioral Health Task Force to really reimagine how we deliver mental health in a more efficient way, substance abuse, treatment, bringing together more than 100 providers, local and state leaders, consumers, parents, advocates, to design a system that puts people first. You know, what became crystal clear in the early days of their work is there is a real need for a comprehensive, coordinated behavioral health service. Because right now, navigating care is extremely complicated process across 10 state agencies and 75 programs. It's easy to see how someone in need could get lost between them. And it's inefficient because of duplication of services and excessive overhead from 75 different programs uh, many of which overlap across 10 state agencies. That's, that's complex and challenging for consumers. At the end of the day, it means too many Coloradans are slipping through the cracks when there are ways to help them. Uh, in, in other ways, this pandemic has only exacerbated those flaws. It's really uh, made it tough on everybody from a, a mental health perspective, spiritual health, a psychological perspective. It's been very... Uh, challenging times for all of us on top of the direct physical health threat and, and the economic threat. The behavioral health 
uh, damage only is compounding from the stress associated with the pandemic directly and indirectly. Uh, you know, we need, to, we need to streamline this. We need to make this more efficient and put people first, and that's why we're, we're taking action. The Behavioral Health Blueprint today sets a bold, achievable vision for making behavioral health more efficient and more effective. Centralizing care, making it so consumers have a one-stop shop for behavioral needs, eliminating duplication and replication, helps patients and providers navigate how they can get the help they need. This structure allows local flexibility. It allows local communities to design the care and implement the care that works best for them. It really reimagines how we understand and conceive of behavioral health in our state. It shouldn't be the patient that's forced to adapt to a complex bureaucratic system. It should be a system that adapts to the unique needs of every patient. This allows us to help more people, save more lives, and by putting people first, we can focus on really getting people the care that they need in a streamlined and efficient way. Now, today's uh, blueprint is not just a report, it's an action plan. And we look forward to working with all stakeholders to shift the paradigm and revolutionize how we deliver behavioral health in Colorado by putting people first. Agencies are going to begin work today on implementing the recommendations over the coming years. We'll look forward to working with legislators on both sides of the aisle to help make this vision, this people first vision, a reality. Now, I know that nothing is easy. If, if something was easy in politics, it would have been done already. But if we do this right, we'll save lives, help Coloradans thrive, improve uh, the efficiency of service delivery, and be able to uh, make the state government more efficient in serving more people with the resources we have. Reform is long overdue, and I really hope that folks could come together around this vision to execute on this important mission uh, with these recommendations and action plan. I want to thank, uh, I thanked a number of the volunteer uh, commission members. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, somebody who's worked very hard on this, not just in the task force, but has long been a champion of Colorado's, Coloradans facing uh, mental health challenges. And that's our uh, amazing Lieutenant Governor, Diane Primavera. Diane served on the exec executive committee for the task force. She was the executive sponsor of the COVID-19 special assignment committee looking at the behavioral health challenges around COVID-19. Uh, and Diane is, is not a newcomer uh, to the issues of Coloradans that are uh, in crisis. The Lieutenant Governor has been a lifelong champion of affordable, accessible care, and her leadership has been key in really helping us reach this point today and of course will continue to be key on the roadmap of implementation for it. It's my honor to introduce Lieutenant Governor Diane Primavera. Well, thank you, Governor Polis, and I'm glad to be here today to see the culmination of such uh, important work that we've done. Um, as a task force member on both the executive committee and the COVID-19 Special Assignment Committee, I can personally attest to the long hours and brain power uh, poured into this blueprint. So I want to thank everyone who was involved in this process and who made today's blueprint possible. And I especially want to thank those who came to the listening sessions and shared their stories. Um, those heart-wrenching stories I will remember and take with me as we begin to implement this blueprint. I also want to take a moment to reflect upon those that are not here with us today. Too many Coloradoans across the state have lost loved one, a loved one to suicide or substance use because they could not get the life-saving care that they needed. One of those grieving Coloradoans is Leon Whitner, who served on our task force COVID, COVID committee and whose painful experience informed our work. I applaud his courage for being able to serve on the task force. Leon's daughter, Sarah, began to struggle with opioid use disorder after she had surgery in 2012. In 2018, Sarah courageously shared her story of recovery from addiction as part of our state's opioid anti-stigma campaign, Lift the Label. Sarah showed countless Coloradoans that recovery is possible with the right care and support. Earlier this year, Sarah was doing well in, sobri in sobriety. She was working at a health association and was planning her wedding. Then the pandemic hit. 
Within days, Sarah lost her normal support system, like seeing friends, for example, and she began to struggle with opioid use disorder. Her monthly shot of medication-assisted treatment was delayed by the pandemic. Tragically, Sarah died from an overdose on April 16th, just one day before her next treatment. I share this story today because September 23rd would have been Sarah's 32nd birthday. Without that interruption to her care, Sarah would still be here, and she may have even joined us at this press conference today. So simply put, the system is broken. We need to do a better job serving those who are struggling with behavioral health issues. And this blueprint provides a roadmap for how we can do that. At the outset of our work, we pledge to leave no Coloradoan behind. So I'm especially proud that this plan outlines ways to better serve those who have historically faced barriers to care, including Coloradoans of color, indigenous Coloradoans, Coloradoans with various disabilities, LGBTQ plus Coloradoans, and our veterans. We know that Coloradoans who belong to multiple identity groups often struggle the most to get the services that they need. It's time that we face this challenge head on and bring equitable, inclusive care to all corners of our state. So this massive transformation of our behavioral health care system will not be easy, but it pales in comparison to the challenges faced by those struggling with mental illness, suffering from addiction and substance use disorder, or those who have lost a loved one. And these changes are necessary in order for us to save lives. We must ensure that every Coloradoan experiencing behavioral health needs can receive timely, high quality services in their communities in a cost efficient manner. Over the past, every story that we've heard, like Sarah's, has been a reminder of the urgency of this challenge that we face and how important it is to get it right. We owe it to families like Sarah's to keep fighting and that's what drives my passion for sure. This blueprint is not just a plan, it's a promise to do better. And I'm proud to have been part of this important project and I look forward to working with you all to make it a reality. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Patricia Oliver. She has worked with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their families and communities for over 20 years. In 2010, Dr. Oliver founded Oliver Behavioral Consultants where she leads an interdisciplinary team with the goal of providing comprehensive intervention for children and adults with developmental disabilities. Dr. Oliver? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for that wonderful introduction. And as you've heard, I am Patricia Oliver, and I'm the founder of Oliver Behavioral Consultants. We are based out of Westminster, and we provide speech, occupational therapy, uh, behavioral health and applied behavioral services for individuals with developmental disabilities. Mostly our constituents live in the Adams County area. Um, our, um, our team takes pride in getting to know each client very well. We want to understand their background. We want to make sure we know their experiences. We want to make sure we can help them craft some of those goals for the future. And tailoring that treatment um, to their unique needs is the way we see that holistic approach to successful intervention. In our current system, it is really hard right now to truly deliver personal care. My staff and I spend hours dealing with insurance companies, trying to figure out funding sources or uh, what kind of paperwork we need depending on where the client um, is based, basically. The barriers can be especially tall for um, historically marginalized clients, like my own Hispanic or Latinx communities. Um, imagine going through a mental health crisis and trying to figure out your insurance benefits in a different language, and then perhaps coming out finding a provider who may not understand your culture or your language. It's a challenge, it's really hard. That's why I am so excited, I was so excited to join the Behavioral Health Task Force. By reforming our system, we can put our clients first and let our clinicians do what they know to do best, provide vital, life-changing care to families in need. For providers and clients, there is so much to like in this blueprint. Our proposed care coordination structure gives clients a one-to-one -one support they deserve as they navigate care options. 
As you heard others describe previously, it is a very confusing system currently. Having a one-point contact is going to make a life difference for our constituents. The care navigators were also going to be able to connect clients to public assistance programs like SNAP and affordable housing. We must help clients secure these basic needs if we want them to make the progress in their mental health or substance use treatment. But what gets me the most excited is our plan for workforce development. We call for stepping up cultural competency training and hiring more clinicians of color so all clients can bring their authentic selves to the clinic. When we talk about system reform, it often sounds complicated um, and impersonal. So let me tell you quick, two quick stories about how I see this reform helping our own clients. We serve this wonderful 11-year-old boy who has presents with an array um, of needs across his development. And we're able to provide support in some of these areas, but there are other areas, uh, some of his uh, more uh, like housing and food banks, some of the other different needs that we don't specialize in. So currently, we're responsible, or feel responsible, to make sure that this youngster and his family are able to access these supports. So we spend hours helping them get where they need to go. The care navigators are going to be able to help them do this. So we can actually concentrate on the mental health piece and all his other needs across behavioral domains. Um, the other piece here is um, I just wanted to share how I feel this is going to help my own family. My family historically has suffered from mental health um, illnesses and or, 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 or issues, and the stigma my community has associated with mental health support is so great that they really can see that there is help very close to them. The few times they've reached out for help, then they may not find a provider who speaks their language or understands their culture, so they retract immediately from the support services. These care navigators are going to help me help my family, and I am beyond grateful and excited for this opportunity. We shouldn't be asking Coloradans to conform to our system. We need a system that's flexible and adaptable to their needs, all of our needs. Our reimagined system does just that, while reducing the red tape for clinicians and providers. I am so thrilled to release this blueprint, and I urge all of you to help us enact these recommendations as quickly as possible. When it comes to supporting Coloradans, we don't have time to waste. Together, we can build a truly equitable system that puts people first. Gracias, Gobernador, Michelle, Barnes, para, la, para por darme la oportunidad de ser parte de este esfuerzo tan importante para mi comunidad. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Michelle Barnes, for the opportunity to be part of this amazing effort for our community. Now, I am delighted to introduce Vincent Achity, President and CEO of Mental Health Colorado. Vincent is an advocate for public, public health and health equity, a population health management strategist, and a builder of communications Bridges connecting communities and community partners with better health outcomes. Vincent? Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Mental Health Colorado, founded in 1953, is the state's leading mental health advocacy organization. We aim to achieve healthier minds across the lifespan for all Coloradans by promoting mental wellness, ensuring timely access to quality health care and supports, and ending shame and discrimination. It's been such an honor for me to serve on the Governor's Behavioral Health Task Force. The mental health needs of Coloradans, as you've heard, are dire. Our state consistently ranks in the bottom third of the nation in terms of the magnitude of our health needs and the difficulties we too often face in accessing quality care. More than half of the Coloradans who need care never get it. We have one of the highest suicide rates in the country. Through our misuse of alcohol and other drugs, we harm ourselves, our families, and each other. And we too often rely on law enforcement to respond to mental health crises, leading to criminalization, injuries, and death. Jails and prisons are our largest mental health facilities. While Colorado's mental health needs are greater and the outcomes are poorer than in many other states, that poor mental health is the secret pandemic that predates 
will long outlast and be gravely exacerbated by the coronavirus is not unique to us. Every state in the nation has a mental health problem that is devastating to individuals, families, and communities. People suffer, the economy suffers, and because of the persistent shame and discrimination, we can barely bring ourselves to recognize that we have a problem. But in Colorado, we do have a unique cause for optimism. Thanks to leadership from the governor's office and from the Capitol, we are aware of the important work that needs to be done and have been making important progress in passing laws and changing practices in recent years. The work of this Behavioral Health Task Force put the health needs of Coloradans exactly where they belong, at the center of an effort to ensure that people can get the quality care that they need in a timely way so that lives can be improved and saved. Through a series of events over the course of the year, task force members heard public testimony from all over the state. Coloradans told story after heartbreaking story about the incredible difficulties they face in getting good health care for themselves and for their loved ones. From a consumer's perspective, it sometimes seems like there are only wrong doors. People who misuse alcohol and drugs almost always have unmet mental health needs. And people with unmet mental health needs often medicate themselves with alcohol and drugs. But when people present themselves for much needed care, they encounter a health care system, a provider workforce, and payer systems that don't seem to understand that substance use and mental health needs go hand in hand. When people present themselves for much needed care, they find that it's unavailable due to the complexity of their needs, unaffordable, or both, and that their health insurance does not provide adequate coverage. AP program through my work which covered three visits. The process was not easy and very frustrating. A month later I was finally able to schedule an appointment for Olivia. Of course there was an issue with one of the visits and the facility charges $270 for a one-hour visit. I cannot afford this amount of money to have my daughter in counseling several times a week. 
In the summer after she turned 12, she was taken to her pediatrician to have a wellness check, and the physician noticed the wounds of cutting. She gave us a number of a counselor that would use a sliding scale for payments. We were told to have Olivia tested for learning issues, and it was discovered that she had ADD and dyslexia. It was suggested that Olivia be put on medication for her ADD. Her pediatrician wanted us to meet with a psychiatrist to make sure she was put on the right medication. I called to get Olivia an appointment, and even with a referral, we had to wait for two months to get in to see a psychiatrist for her appointment. So I scheduled that appointment for January of 2018. On December 19, 2017, my 12-year-old daughter tried to end her life. She was transported to a local hospital and then was transferred to a behavior health program in Denver. We were never allowed to meet with any of our physicians. The only person that we were allowed to speak with was a nurse. Olivia was with kids of various ages, including 18-year-olds. My daughter was released on Christmas Eve. I do not feel like this very expensive hospital stay to help my daughter in any way. If anything, it made her worse. After she was released from the hospital, my older daughter confided to me that Olivia said that other kids told her to tell her that, say that she was not suicidal so she could be released. I brought Olivia back to Eagle and contacted a hospital in Denver that had a partial hospitalization program. We were able to get Olivia into the program. She attended for 12 days, and then we were told our insurance would not allow her to stay any longer. We came back to Eagle, and Olivia continued counseling. She saw her psychiatrist on Monday, February 5th, the family counselor on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, February 7th, three days after her 13th birthday, my worst nightmare became real. Olivia succeeded at ending her life. It was reported in the morning to the school at 8.30 that she was thinking about suicide. No one contacted me until after she had been released from school. No one at the school checked on Olivia to see how she was doing during the day. The school counselor did not do a mental health assessment on her, even though she had a prior suicide attempt, and that was their protocol, she would have been transported to a facility if they had done so. When I was allowed to get my daughter's phone back from the police department, I saw text messages from kids calling her nasty names. One of Olivia's last text messages written on the night of February 6th said, yeah, the ones that tell me to kill myself. I do, not feel that my I do feel my daughter could have been saved, but she was just a num number being pushed through the system that failed us. No one took the time to completely understand what my daughter was going through so they could help her. Maybe if I could have afforded the $270 counselor visits, or if the school followed protocol, Olivia would be here with me today. Earlier this year, I my, shared my story with the Behavioral Health Task Force in hopes that it would highlight the need for change in the system. I tried many different ways, many different times to get help for Olivia, but they did not work. The task force heard me. The recommendations they have put forth that have been supported by Governor Polis will mean that families will have a different experience in the future. They, they will have a easier and more timely services access to services. They will never, they will be able to work with someone who makes sure that people are connected to the services they need. Mothers won't have to go through what I went through. No one ever should. Thank you. Let's just have a moment, pause before we continue. That was a really powerful story, Vicki, and I thank you for your courage um, to share that. And we heard hundreds of stories around the state just like Vicki's, where people talked about how the system had failed them. And I'm excited that today we're presenting to the governor a blueprint which will make lives better for so many Coloradans. So, Governor, um, can I give you the blueprint? Yeah, and can you Thank sign you. it so it's real? for you. <laughs> And we'll say, let's get to work, Michelle. Let's get it done. Great job, everybody. Are there any questions anyone would like to ask before we close up? 
Okay, I think, oh, j go ahead, please. So there's two parts to that. Um, it's nice to see you. Uh, one is um, the new behavioral health authority, or administration, excuse me, will help us be more efficient and more effective with every dollar we spend at the state. And sometimes we may be pushing you from one department to another because that's where the funding sits to deal with your situation. What's really gonna make a big difference for families like Vicki's is our regional care coordination model where a mother and a family in crisis would never be given a phone number and handed off. As Patricia mentioned, they'd have somebody that works with them and navigates and advocates to them until they get the help they need. So the care coordination model will make a huge difference for families like, uh, like Vicki's. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's, you know, when you talk about are we really going to implement it, it really does often come down to not just will, but money. Uh, for the first year, it's going to be um, funded out of the Office of Behavioral Health within my department that Dr. Robert Worthwine runs. And we'll be um, using existing resources, we'll be reallocating things, and we'll be continuing to rely on the good people behind me. To, to help us get where we need to get. We will then be putting um, proposals in front of the legislature, but the governor um, has made it very clear that um, this isn't the time to be putting a lot of budget proposals forward, and we adapted and we changed, and we're happy to say this will cost you nothing net new, Governor. Okay, thank you everyone, appreciate it. Patricia, I know you got to run. Hey, thank you so much.